The purpose of this video is to provide you with some instructions for using my Obsession for Windows program. Generally speaking, I think you're going to find that most of this is fairly intuitive. I'm going to assume you already know how to play Obsession or that you're somewhat familiar with the game. If you're not, I recommend you check out some of my tutorial videos. I'll put links to them in the show notes. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how a typical turn would work using my Obsession for Windows program. I've set up here for a very basic beginner solo game of Obsession using all the default values for setup. The only thing I'm going to do here is change the name from Player1 to my name. The first thing I need to do after I click OK is to select a family. If you're new to the game, I recommend you choose the Ponsonby family, which is what I'm going to do right now. You can see that my family bonus is that I start the game with 300 pounds, as opposed to nothing. Now I'm presented with the starting builder's market and my set of five starting objectives. For now, so as not to overwhelm you with too much information at once, I'm going to press the space bar, as indicated here in the message, to close all that and display my starting hand of family and guest cards. Before I begin, I want to demonstrate that whenever I hover my mouse over any of the tiles in my country estate, a large version of the tile, along with its backside, is displayed in the corner of the screen. Like so. Similarly, whenever I hover over any card in my hand, I can also see a larger version of the card. I can even press the Z key on my keyboard to zoom in and see the card up close. Alternatively, I can press the L key to lock the image on the screen so that when I move my mouse around, it doesn't disappear and get replaced by another image. That is, until I click the large image to make it go away. The basic turn in Obsession consists of choosing an existing activity tile in my country estate, choosing the people in my hand that I want to invite to that activity, assigning the necessary servants to the activity tile and the invited guests, and then resolving everything to reap the rewards of my efforts. For example, you can see that if I wanted to host a game of whist in the front parlor, I would need to assign the red housekeeper to the activity for my available service. My red housekeeper is there and ready to go to work, and then I would need to invite two ladies from my hand to attend that activity. I'm going to click on the front parlor now, and my program is going to assign the red housekeeper automatically. As you can see, my housekeeper has left available service and is now sitting on top of the tile. I can right-click this tile to return it to my estate, and that will automatically return the housekeeper to available service as well. This time I'm going to select the front parlor once again, but I'm going to hold down the shift key while I click it. By holding down the shift key and shift clicking the tile, I'm instructing my program not to automatically assign any servants to it. So if I wanted to assign the housekeeper myself, I could simply click and drag her to the tile. Perhaps for some reason I wanted to assign a different servant to the activity in place of my housekeeper. I could right-click the housekeeper to return her to available service, and click and drag a different servant that could take her place. Of course, I don't have another servant like that at the moment. And if I try to drag a servant onto the tile that doesn't belong there, like this green valet, it wouldn't stick. So I'll simply reassign my housekeeper to the activity tile once again. Generally speaking, you can click the activity that you want to host, and the program will automatically take care of the necessary service as long as the requisite servants are available to you. 
Instead of playing whist in the front parlor, I could alternatively host an afternoon tea in the main gazebo. If I now click this tile, the front parlor and the red housekeeper will go back to where they belong, and the main gazebo will take its place. Since a white footman is required, and I have a white footman in available service, then he'll be assigned automatically when I click the gazebo. For this afternoon tea, I need to invite two gentry, that is, any two people for my hand of cards. I'm going to choose to invite the family's daughter, Lady Margaret Carlo. Because she's a family member, she doesn't require a servant to attend to her. Once selected, you see that she's marked with a purple circle to indicate that she's now one of my guests. If I wanted to deselect her, I'd just click her again. Perhaps in her place I want to invite the matriarch of my family instead, Mabel, Countess of Ponsonby. For my second guest, I'm going to choose to invite the reliable Colonel Walter Dalrymple. You'll notice that he requires a green valet in attendance, and since I have a green valet in available service, the program will assign it automatically to the Colonel when I invite the Colonel to this activity. Just as before, I could right-click the ballot to return him to available service and drag another suitable servant to the card in his place. Of course, I don't have one, so I'll bring the ballot back. I could uninvite the colonel by clicking him again, and the ballot will return to available service. This time, I'll shift-click the colonel so that the ballot isn't automatically assigned. All right, I've set up my activity with the necessary white footman, and I've assigned the necessary guests. Of course, if you noticed, I haven't assigned the valet to the colonel. And if I tried to invite a third guest, say Theodore, Earl of Ponsonby, the father, and then click Continue, my program would not permit it and will display an appropriate message. You can see it's saying I've not invited the correct number of a guest to the activity. If I deselect the patriarch of the family so that now I only have two guests selected and click continue again, I get a message indicating that I've not assigned the correct type of servant to Walter Dalrymple. This time I'm not going to let that go unnoticed. I'm now ready to host the activity. The main gazebo is going to invite a prestige guest to my hand. That's the meaning of the two floors to Lee. Colonel Dalrymple is going to increase my reputation by two steps from 1.1 to 1.3. And Mabel could either let me dismiss a guest or she can invite a screened casual guest to my hand. That's the meaning of the single floor to Lee. By screen casual guest, I mean the program will draw two casual guests and let me choose the one I want to invite, returning the other to the bottom of the deck. Now, with all the correct service assigned, I can click Continue to Proceed. I'll press P to pause the program so you can see exactly what's going on. The first thing that's going to happen is that I'm going to gain the two reputation thanks to Colonel Dalrymple. You can see that my reputation has now increased to 1.3. Next, when I now unpause, a prestige guest should have ring the doorbell and get added to my hand of cards. It's Alice, Dowager Countess Holt. She has a prestige rating of 5, so I won't be able to invite her to an activity until my family reputation is increased from 1.3, where it currently stands, to 5.1. She's also worth three victory points at the end of the game. My program is now asking which favor of Mabel's I'd like to receive. Should I draw two casual guests and choose one, or should I dismiss one guest? Clearly, it's the first turn of the game, so I don't have any guests I need to dismiss just yet. So I'll elect to draw the two casual guests and choose one to keep. All right, I have a choice between two very similar guests. 
Miss Anne Harlow, warm and generous and an excellent whist player, and Lee Sarah Lewis, well-traveled and opinionated. Each of these two guests provide a favor of 100 pounds, but Anne Harlow requires a lady's maid, while Sarah Lewis can get by without any servant in attendance. They're both worth zero victory points, so I'm going to choose to invite Lady Sarah Lewis. Now we're at the step in the order of play where I can purchase a tile from the builder's market. I want to go slow here for a moment to demonstrate exactly how my program works when the builder's market is on display, because it could be a tad confusing at first. Because I'm being asked to optionally purchase a tile from the market, if I hover my mouse over a card in my hand, I'll see the large version of the card appear in the corner as usual, but the builder's market won't be obscured by the rest of my hand. But once I've moved my mouse over a tile on the builder's market, if I subsequently happen to move my mouse up to check a card again in my hand, this time my hand of cards displays in full. In order to bring the builder's market back into view, all I need to do is move my mouse to the bottom half of one of the cards. The builder's market reappears. In this way, I can easily alternate between viewing my hand of cards and the builder's market simply by moving my mouse higher or lower on the screen. Okay, let's take a look at the builder's market. We have a servant's quarters over here in the 300 pound slot, a writing stables in the 400 pound slot. We have two tennis courts in the 500 pound slot, a smoking room in the 600 pound slot, a drawing room in the 700 pound slot, and an English garden in the 800 pound slot. The tile that I really want to purchase is the servant's quarters, a blue service tile that will let me assign one servant every turn from servant's quarters instead of from available service. When I hover over the servant's quarters tile, you can see that a tooltip appears describing that ability. Unfortunately, the servant's quarters costs 400 pounds, 300 pounds pre-printed on the board, plus the 100 pound modifier shown in the corner of the tiles. And as the Ponce and Bees, I only started the game with the 300 pound family bonus. And I didn't host an activity or invite a guest that had a money favor that would have supplemented that balance. But what I can do, however, is use a special action. I'm going to click the SA button here to display the three special actions available to me. On the one hand, I can spend two reputation and gain 100 pounds. Or if I had three reputation, I could spend it to refresh a servant if I had one in servant's quarters. Finally, if I had four reputation, I could choose to refresh the builder's market and recycle all the tiles there. Obviously, what I want to do is spend the two reputation I received from Walter Dalrymple and convert it into 100 pounds. So I'm going to right click my 300 pound balance and that's going to instruct my program to perform the special action. You can see that when I'm hovered over the 300 pounds, I get a tooltip that says right click here to spend two reputation in exchange for 100 pounds. If there was a servant in servant's quarters and I hovered over it, it might say right click here to spend three reputation to refresh the servant. And if I hover over the refresh button in the builder's market, I get a tooltip that says click here to spend four reputation to refresh the builder's market. I'm going to right click on my 300 pound balance, which will spend the two reputation I have and give me 100 more pounds, getting me up to 400 pounds. Now that my reputation is bottomed out, I can't right click this again, even if I try, nothing's going to happen because I don't have the two reputation to spend. But now I have a balance of 400 pounds, which is just enough to buy the servant's quarters and add it to my estate. Once I do that, 
It will be added to my country estate in the blue service column. The remaining tiles in the builder's market will slide left and a new tile will be drawn to fill in the 800 pound slot. Then my program will automatically clear my player board. The white footman on the main gazebo and the green valet on Colonel Walter Dalrymple will move to expended service where they'll be unavailable to me for exactly one turn. Then Mabel and Colonel Dalrymple, the two guests that I invited to this activity, will leave my hand and be added to my discard pile. Finally, the main gazebo will flip to its activated or row side and return to my country estate. And instead of providing minus two victory points at the end of the game, the flip version will be worth positive two victory points. All right, I'm now going to click the message to clear it and go ahead and purchase the servants' quarters. This is my discard pile over here, and I can click on any of the cards in this list to display the large image. Notice that when I now hover over the main gazebo to view the large image of its two sides, the row side is highlighted with a black border around it, indicating that the row side of the main gazebo is currently face up in my estate. Also notice that when I hover over the servants' quarters, I only see a large version of its front side. That's because its back side is identical, so there's no need to display both sides of the tile. I want to return your attention to the builder's market once again and point out that once the reserves have been set up, that is the service reserve and the PR1 reserve, there will be a list of tiles in these boxes, just like there's a list of cards in my discard pile up here. And I could single click a tile in the list to display it, or I could double click a tile in the list to purchase it for 300 pounds, plus or minus any modifier on the tile. It's now the AI's turn. I'm going to end my turn and the program will roll the 20-sided die and possibly remove one tile from the builder's market, depriving me of that option. But for a complete understanding of how that mechanism actually works, I'm going to refer you to my tutorial videos. End the turn. The AI rolls the die, rolls a 14, and removes the English garden from the builder's market. It's now round two, and I'm ready to take another turn. The program has automatically rotated my service. Any servants that were in servants' quarters moved to available service. I had none at the time. And the valet and the footman that used to be in expended service shifted into servants' quarters. Because I own the servants' quarters tile, I'll be able to make use of one of the servants in the servants' quarters this turn if I wanted to. For example, if I choose the bowling green, which will require the service of a white footman, my program knows I own the servants' quarters, so it will assign the white footman automatically. Notice that when a servant has been removed from servants' quarters, Due to the effect of the servants' quarters tile, the label servants' quarters turns black to indicate that you can't now try to drag another servant off the servants' quarters. It just won't work. But if I return the bowling green, the servants' quarters turns white again, and now I can freely click and drag a servant off of it if I wanted to, to drag it onto a card or a tile. Also, if you didn't notice, when the white footman was assigned to the bowling green from servants' quarters, if I right-click the white footman or right-click the bowling green tile to deselect it, my program remembers that the white footman came from servants' quarters and returns in there. Notice that I'm ahead plus three in essentials for purposes of the courtship, and I'm ahead plus one in service and ahead by plus four in the estate column. So if the Fairchilds decided that either of those three categories was important to them, 
come the close of the first season, I'd win the first courtship, earn a VP card, and be able to add either Charles or Elizabeth Fairchild to my hand. That's assuming, of course, that I didn't take advantage of the private study and change the victory point tally. On the other hand, if I don't do something about prestige or sporting, I'm going to lose the courtship if one of those theme cards shows up. I'm nine points behind on prestige and four points behind on sporting. Probably choosing the Bowling Green this turn would be a good idea. Eventually, you're going to have to pass, either because you don't have enough cards in your hand to host an activity, or because you think passing is a strategically sound thing to do. When you click Pass, you're presented with three options. To hire two servants, collect 200 pounds, or refresh the builder's market. More often than not, you'll want to hire two servants but you would choose whichever option you think makes the most sense for you. When you do choose to hire two servants, the program automatically brings the butler's room into the current activity, assigns the butler to it, and then you can proceed to choose the two servants you want to add from the servants for hire area. Let me do that now to demonstrate. So I'm going to hire two servants. The builder's market moves into position with the, with the butler assigned to it. And now I can choose from the servants for hire which two servants I want to add. Notice I can't choose the under butler. The only way to get an under butler is via the butler's pantry. For now, I'm going to choose one valet and one lady's maid. butler's room flips to its row side where it's now worth one point and now I'm two points ahead in that category and that will bring this instructional video to a close please watch the next video in this series which will cover how to best manage the cards in your hand the cards in your discard pile your country estate and some other related topics of interest thanks for watching